<clears throat> Hello. Hi, Anish. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. And you? Sorry, I was. Yeah, good, good. Thank you. I'm trying to put up the, um, the topics. Do you see on top science biology? And now yes. I'm searching for ecology or environment. There's yeah. environmentalism. Environmentalism, yeah. Maybe. <clears throat> I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, there's not too many options. There is uh, environmentalism, and then, oh, yeah, that's it, I think. What? There's no ecology. Okay, that's probably the closest we can get. I'm sorry. <laughs> like for science, it's yeah. very no, limited. No problem. Environmentalism and biology covers it pretty well. Okay. How are you? Um, Sorry. <laughs> I'm here with Aaron as well. Both of us are on the same um, microphone. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Perfect. Good. Uh, yeah, that works. So welcome both. <laughs> welcome Aaron too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sharing now the document so we can check. Okay. Working. Yeah, let me add it. Okay. There. You do you see it? Should be there now. I see it. Yeah. Perfect. And now I will share your websites in the chat for everyone so that okay, they perfect. can I'm sorry, there are things I can only do once the time has started, so I squeeze in a lot of... And then, Erin, you have... I found two. I found the one that's um, your own or the one that is by... One. Yeah, uh, you can use the one that's my own I, my work one okay. just directs to the one that's my own <laughs> okay perfect yeah so i did that and now i'll sure. add the paper the paper link <clears throat> sorry <laughs> for that's why i start earlier so we get all of this done before <laughs> <laughs> actual start time and welcome everyone nice to see everyone here and um yeah we'll start in around five minutes so we have a few minutes which gives me time to say on twitter that we are about to start too cool. and yeah, thanks for doing this, for coming here, you know, making the account and everything. Did did you, since you made the account, try out Clubhouse a little bit or, you know? Um, I haven't, to be honest, I'm a little naive when it comes to the <clears throat> uh, social media technology. I did try and listen to, to a few other podcasts that had been posted from previous speakers. Um, so I, I did I did listen in on a few of those, um, but I I'm, I'm still learning the app. Let's put it that way. Oh yeah, yeah, that's totally fine. I <laughs> was just checking in general if it's you know um, I listen to I used to you know when when the shutdown was people used to be here you know almost all day long. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And so <laughs> you can, you know, their music rooms, their yoga rooms, meditation rooms, political rooms, news rooms, or clubs and mm -hmm. different science clubs and book clubs and, you know, anything you can imagine you can find on here. So, um, yeah, you can easily spend your whole day. And then, um, you know, when the Ukraine war started, there was an ongoing room for oh, months yeah. Oh, yeah. that had like millions of people in the end, I believe. Um, 
participating over time, so it was 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Then there's an Iranian room to keep us updated about what's happening there and, you know, all kinds yeah. of stuff. Well, <laughs> you can uh, always be on here. So we're exploring on it. Um, it's pretty new to us, but it's very cool. Yeah. Sounds very cool. <laughs> Yeah, it used to be way more busy since people were just, you know, stuck at home. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but yeah, there's still a lot going on then, especially if you want to listen to people uh, in different countries with like their viewpoint is what how news are perceived there and so on. I think that part is really interesting, if you know, you're interested. Mm hmm. And some, the one that I usually listen to and comment on is tech news, but they move to Twitter spaces. Um, so, uh, you know, Twitter has something similar, but I feel for recording sessions like ours, um, you know, it, Twitter still has a lot of issues, bugs, and, and I'm not willing to deal with that for yeah, moving I, to Twitter. Especially this seems to be a very um, busy uh, busy chat room or I guess you have multiple uh, speakers on every week and so there's it's it, there's always something happening right you need a, a platform that can accommodate it. Yeah exactly that works like all the time it would be at the, I feel like a disaster if you know we spend, I don't know, some time, like a month or two to, you know, to meet and plan and, <laughs> and you know, the app wouldn't work. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. and that would be to find another time again, that, it would just be very embarrassing. So I'm not willing to. How long to... has um, this been going on, Science Society on, on Clubhouse? So that I made the own club out of it, it's mm -hmm. pretty, uh, a little bit over a year. Um, before okay. I just did it in other clubs or just, you know, randomly, not so planned. What drove me to create this very own club was that, you know, like when I first came here, I was pretty shocked. Like I was on social media before a lot and stuff like that. Um, I was pretty shocked at like, how negative the idea was was of people of science and and scientists how we are and and all of that and um i wanted to and people ask me a lot of questions of fields that i don't know much about so i started to invite people that actually you know know what they're saying because they work mm -hmm. in the field and then in other clubs this would then get mixed up with people talking that really don't know what they are talking about and i felt like i would just contribute to that fake versus actual knowledge by mixing that up kind of if you know what mm -hmm. i mean so to give legitimacy to people that don't know at all what they are talking about by having also people on that are actual scientists that's why i then created also was one of the reasons I created the own club. So when people come here, they know I invite the people that are actually working on this and not just people pretending to know about the field. So anyways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great idea. We're, we're certainly on board with it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, oh, it's 12, so uh, we can just start. Um, mm -hmm. I think people will still be coming in, but let's start with introductions and then we'll go from there. So welcome everyone to Science Society and a special welcome to you, Anish and um, Eric. And before we start, let me give the audience a short introduction so they get to know you a little bit. So mm -hmm. Dr. Anish Bose, he is um, a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Wildlife, Fish, Environmental Studies at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. 
and um, he did his bachelor in science in marine and freshwater biology at the University of Gulf, if I say it right, in Canada. Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> and PhD in psychology and neuroscience and behavior at the McMaster University in Canada with in the lab of Dr. Siegel um, Pulshine. Siegel, um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> you for correcting me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad you're correcting me. And... Um, <clears throat> And then he did um, different uh, postdoctoral um, research, but let's get into that uh, with the interview uh, later on. And um, Dr. Erin McCallum, um, she's a behavioral ecologist and ecotoxicologist. Um, and she is really interested in understanding the causes and con consequences of anthropogenic stressors for aquatic life. And um, she would like to, with her research, to provide like a scientific and uh, informed policy for conserving fish, aquatic habitats, and freshwater resource resources. And she is an assistant professor at SLU in Umea, Sweden. And um, yeah, as I said, you can um, check out the, um, the bios in the, on the website that I shared. And uh, hi, Victoria. <laughs> you made it. How are you? I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, Victoria is our co-moderator um, and meet Anish and um, Aaron here that will be presenting today. Oh, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Katarina, Anish, Aaron. Um, is Aaron, does Aaron have their own separate PTR or do I just not see it on my screen or are they sharing? Um, we yeah, are, sure. Aaron and I are both sitting together at the same. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we thought it would be just sitting like down the hall from one another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, fantastic. Victoria, I know you just arrived. Do you want me to ask the interview questions or do you want to go ahead? Both of I am prepared and I'm ready to go. Wow. Even though we have, yeah, we have lots of snow outside. I just have to announce that. I'm originally from California, so whenever it snows here, it's an enormous, exciting event. So, anyway, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I am completely ready if, if everyone else is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we uh, are ready to go at your at your. All pace. right, thank you, and and please remind me we have Anish and who else do we have? Uh, Aaron. Aaron. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. So great. This question can be for both of you. So welcome again to Science Society. We're so grateful that you're here to share your work with us, and the question is to give us um, a, a personal side to the to the guest speakers and maybe learn a little bit more about what drives you toward your research and even drives your research. So when do you feel that your passion for science developed and or when did you first notice that initial spark? And this could be in your childhood or anywhere in your life. Um, should I start? Yeah. I can start. Um, yeah. That, uh has been there since the beginning for me. I always wanted to work with animals. I think that was uh, a real passion of mine since as long as I can remember. Um, I always was drawn to uh, aquatic animals in particular. I'm not sure why, but <clears throat> in fact, when I when I look back at a lot of the Oh, old finger paintings that I made when I was in preschool or or daycare. Um, I was I was drawing pictures of fish, and so for some reason I was always really interested in, in aquatic animals, and I really wanted to work with animals um, as a career. So I actually forgot a little bit about that passion at the end of high school when I was trying to figure out where I would go. Um, for university, and I wound up starting out in uh, engineering. 
Uh, I did a year of that, but found myself uh, wanting to do something a little bit more um, closely connected to animals and nature. And so I wound up switching to marine biology. Uh, and so it was really like, yeah, a rediscovery of my, my early childhood interests. And then I, I followed that path to where I am now. Yeah, and for for me, I've, I was always an, an animal lover when I was younger. Uh, I loved being outdoors, but I didn't really get into science until I was in um, university. I originally went to university to be a psychologist, so I was doing a Bachelor of Arts originally. Uh, but then I took a, a class called the Biological Basis of Behavior, which was basically an introduction to neuroscience. And that's where I really got interested in, in the sciences and doing uh, research to ask and answer questions. And so I ended up switching my degree from a Bachelor of Arts to a Bachelor of Sciences and then followed the research-focused career path to where I am now. Thank you very much. It's it's especially wonderful to hear both of your your answers together because mm -hmm. some so you have so, so the similarities and differences that you both switched and went to where you needed to be for this moment in your lives, and also that a niche that you had you had that initial initial affinity toward marine you know the marine environment and and it's just it's such a beautiful feeling when you you know when you recognize that and then you don't argue with it and then because you can't it's something it's something innate you know in us i believe at least that's what i believe for myself but i hear these when we hear these stories and we ask our guests and and then they say well i had this feeling and then i tried to do you know, I tried to be an electrician or something, and then I realized yeah. that what I really needed was neuroscience. And and so here you are. And so what I always wonder is, what is it that that helps some people listen and and gives some people the power to act on that, and others, um, it, you know, there's just a longer path, or maybe maybe don't ever align with with that with that feeling. So. Bravo to both of you. And, and then my next question before you dive into your presentation is if you can take us many, maybe through um, some of your favorite jumps along the path that brought you from that moment or that, that study of the research that you chose and eventually up until now. Oof. It's... Uh been a lot of bouncing around. Um, so from my undergraduate time, I always was seeking out opportunities to get research experience in different labs. And so I was I was I was always asking professors if I could volunteer in their in their labs or help out on a field project. And so I wound up getting a lot of um, experience in a variety of different places. So I've worked in some uh, labs where I went out to the field to collect insects in, 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 in lakes and ponds. I've worked in labs where I got to um, go on research vessels in the North Sea or um, the Weddell and Scotia Seas. I've worked in labs where <clears throat> I can I could do field work in lots of different places of the world, like in different parts of Africa or, or Mediterranean, uh, and has really been a, a windy road. But I always find that you take one one step forward, and whenever you are presented with a really cool opportunity, you never say no, and you just keep going. Um, I don't know. It's there's been not much of a plan, but. Uh, the plan has always been go where your interests lie and where the funding lies as well, <laughs> which is pragmatic approach to it. Yeah, and so for me, um, I also started my journey in Canada and then um, moved across the Atlantic to Europe where we both are now. Um, and I guess, I didn't do as much uh, jumping around or, or doing as much field work as, as Anish has done, but I think just, I was always interested in, in research that 
was related to urban environments. So I kind of sought out urban areas and people doing work on urban aquatic ecosystems, which you'll understand more when I start to, we start talking a little bit about the, the project that we're going to present today. Um, otherwise, I don't know, I don't really know what to say about jumps, but uh, moving the from, biggest the biggest jump was moving from after my PhD, moving across uh, the world to Sweden where we are now. So that was a, a really big choice to, you know, leave my family and everything that was in Canada and moved to Sweden. Luckily, Sweden is not too different from Canada in terms of weather, but uh, yeah, it's been a really exciting but also challenging time moving to a country where you don't know or speak the language and setting up a whole new, whole new life here. But Sweden's been very kind to me, so it's been great. Yeah, exactly. I guess we should emphasize we our biggest jump was from across the Atlantic between our PhDs and our postdoc years. Um, uh, we we left Canada to start postdocing around around Europe. And that was both exciting. It was stressful, but it's led us to where we are now. Yeah, I used the word. Thank you for that answer. I used the word jump, maybe so people don't think that they have to um, provide us with, um, you know, an exhaustive bio. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah. I can see words matter, and uh, so hooray, Svelia Yetebra. That's a beautiful place to be. And and these are, are really wonderful and exciting answers to to hear about a little bit of what you've both done and, and what motivates you and, and the importance of following the motivation. And as you say, also the funding and, and that everything that we do shines back onto what we're going to do in the future, you know, and I see it, it shows that all of those all of those jumps did inform um, what you're doing now and and then bring you together to do this work. We love to hear about collaboration here. We try to be a kind of collaboration with bringing science to the people and breaking down barriers of access to science and access to meeting people like both of you. So thank you. And at this point, I will hand you both the mic and your PDF has been pinned by Katarina. So, Everybody can get into that as and follow you along. And then we're here to help field questions. People might put questions in the room chat that we can share with you and also to bring up friends later who might want to do a Q&A following your talk. So thank you so much. Great. So it, if, right. um, if people have questions, will you just <coughs> interrupt us and let us know? Yes, we can do that. No, we... it's, it's up to you. you. You get to choose. It's guest's choice, oh, either, and you either. get to choose if, it, if the questions drive your discussion. That's great. If you want to wait, it's all great. I would say mm -hmm. either is fine. I just we probably won't be watching the, the chat as much. So yeah, it's whatever whatever works. People, you can interrupt if it makes sense at the time, and if not, we'll we'll wait and answer them. Okay, at the end. that's what we usually do. And and yeah. you don't have the responsibility of monitoring the room chat. That's Katarina and I are here to do that. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, the mic is great. yours. So we have a few slides prepared. And, and so when we go through the talk, uh, I guess we will just shout out what slide number is relevant, uh, just to keep people um, on the same uh, pace with us. And uh, the first part of the talk, Aaron will give, and then I'll take over um, for the second half. All right, so as I've been introduced here so far, my name's Erin McCollum and I'm a assistant professor. And what I do a lot of research on is ecotoxicology, meaning uh, st the study of contaminants in the environment and how they impact the environment and the animals that live there. So starting off this talk, if we look at the first, uh, I guess it goes from slides two to four, I have a you, uh, it kind of builds on itself, but this might be what a typical household cupboard would look like in a home in uh, North America or Europe, perhaps, uh, where you have a cupboard somewhere that's stuffed full of medications that you might use or different uh, cleaning products. And we use these kind of uh, products 
quite frequently, sometimes daily in our lives. They can include things like pain relievers that you use to treat a headache, some allergy medications uh, that you might use during the springtime, or different types of prescription medications, uh, as well as things like antibacterial soaps and detergents. And altogether, these compounds are referred to as pharmaceuticals and personal care products. And these the use of these uh, products in developed countries is really common and widespread. If we look at slide five, this graph is showing the production and use of chemicals uh, over the last 50 or so years, scaled to the year 1970. So it really shows that our use of chemicals is on the rise. And I've put some purple boxes here around the number of both approved pharmaceuticals that have gone on the market in the US and global pharmaceutical consumption, which has been growing. And one of the biggest point sources of how these chemical compounds get to aquatic habitats is through um, us consuming them and then traveling to wastewater treatment plants. So if we look at slide six, this is the primary pathway that we'd see where we use a pharmaceutical, we take a pill or something like that, but the dose that we're prescribed or the dose that we consume isn't fully absorbed by our bodies. So some of it is, it is excreted back to a toilet uh, where it's flushed down the drain and makes its way to a wastewater treatment facility. And this facility will treat that water before it's discharged back to surface waters. And when I say surface waters, I mean the, the water we can see on the surface of the planet. So rivers, lakes, the ocean, and so on. What happens in a uh, wastewater treatment plant and the water use cycle is actually quite complex. And so on slide seven, what I'm showing is the wastewater treatment cycle. Wastewater treatment plants uh, collect water waste from homes, businesses, road runoff, and sometimes even industries. And it makes its way to a wastewater facility where it's gonna be run through several steps of treatment to remove and break down contaminants, bacteria, and nutrients, allowing the water to clarify. So after this, wastewater treatment plants might use um, several final cleaning techniques. So I've shown that here with the little electricity boat, bolt showing UV sterilization or using sand or charcoal sterilization. This is all to just make the wastewater as clean as possible before it's put back to surface waters. And when we discharge wastewater back to surface waters, we call it wastewater effluent. So pharmaceuticals really go from being on the shelf in our homes uh, through our bodies, through a wastewater treatment plant, and back to surface waters through this process here. And while waste, the, the pathway that I've just described through wastewater treatment effluents is the main pathway, there are many other ways that pharmaceuticals can enter the environment. And some of these uh, pathways are described in and shown in the infographic on slide eight. So this comes from the OECD or the Organization for economic cooperation and development, which is an international organization uh, that conducts studies like these. And so they're showing some of these other pathways, which can include through aquaculture or the uh, veterinary treatment of livestock. You can get runoff from the improper use and, and disposal of pharmaceuticals and landfills, or even um, runoff from fields that are receiving manure that's been, that contains uh, pharmaceutical products. So there's lots of different ways that pharmaceuticals can get back into the environment, but the main way is through wastewater treatment plants. And so wastewater treatment plants are, a nice kind of schematic of them is shown on slide nine. They tend to look like this, <laughs> uh, very industrial looking, uh, but the main thing I wanna point out and maybe that you've uh, already kind of deduced is that wastewater treatment plants aren't able to remove all the chemicals that flow to them. So on slide 10, I'm showing that there's lots of different chemicals that potentially enter a wastewater treatment plant, uh, but these chemicals aren't really able to be removed. And that's because wastewater treatment plants are kind of an older technology and they weren't really designed to tr deal with modern synthetic chemicals. Wastewater treatment plants are really great at 
breaking down things like uh, nutrients and bacteria to make the water safe. Um, but they're not as good at removing, fully removing contaminants. And so here I show different types of chemicals that can enter from a wastewater treatment plant effluent. But today on slide 11, we're really gonna focus on pharmaceuticals. And that's the focus of a lot of my research over the past decade. Pharmaceuticals have been measured in the environment on a global scale. So on slide 12, I'm showing the results from a recently published study, it came out in 2022, where they measured pharmaceuticals at different sites all over the world. So all these little spots on this map are places where they took samples. And this research team found pharmaceuticals on every continent on Earth, even Antarctica. So pharmaceuticals are really a global problem when we think about them as a novel environmental pollutants. And when they get out into the environment, what happens? On slide 13, what I'm showing you is that when fish are exposed to pharmaceuticals in uh, wastewater effluents, they are able to absorb pharmaceuticals from that wastewater effluent into their tissues. So these are results from a study showing that uh, pharmaceuticals absorb into different uh, types of tissues like the brain or the gonads when fish were uh, exposed to different dilutions of wastewater effluent. So pharmaceuticals are getting out into the environment and they're getting into animal tissues, uh, but what impacts do they have? And if our summary so far on slide 14, what I can say is that hundreds of different pharmaceuticals have been detected and measured in the environment to date, usually at lower concentrations. So I'm talking nanograms to milligram per liter ranges. Um, they can be measured in many different parts of the environment, but today I'm focusing on the aquatic environment. It's a global problem and in, it can impact different biological systems. So this is where I'm getting at what's the ultimate or the downstream effect of animals being exposed to pharmaceuticals in the wild. On slide 15, uh, our main concern is that pharmaceuticals are designed to affect human physiology. So pharmaceuticals act kind of like a lock and key. When you take a pharmaceutical, it has a specific drug target, like a receptor or an enzyme that it's gonna interact with and have some sort of downstream effect in, a, in humans. So I can kind of, you can kind of think of it like a lock and key as an analogy where the pharmaceutical is the key and you have some sort of target in your body that's the lock and they fit together and create some sort of action. But these drug targets that I show on slide 16 are actually quite well conserved across the animal kingdom. So if we focus on the right side of this infographic here, um, of the 549 drug targets that these researchers looked at in humans, they found that 503 of them were present in fish as well. Slightly fewer, so 352 were, were present in Daphnia, which is a type of aquatic invertebrate. Um, and even lower in another uh, aquatic invertebrate species. So just, they're not perfectly conserved, but they're still well conserved, which means that uh, a pharmaceutical that has a biological effect in humans could possibly have the same effect in uh, non-target organisms like fish and aquatic invertebrates. And on slide, what slide are we on? Slide 17, it's harder to see on this slide. <laughs> The pharmaceuticals are designed uh, to modulate human physiology uh, and sometimes even human behavior if we think about psychiatric pharmaceuticals like antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications. Might they also modify the behavior of fish and aquatic uh, invertebrates that are exposed to effluents in the wild? Uh, so this has been kind of a more recently explored question in the field of research that both Anish and I are working in. Uh, and it's an important one to ask, uh, and I hope that we will be able, to, we've started to answer it with our study that we'll talk about today. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Anish now because he's going to talk a little bit about why we should study and care about behavior as a response. Okay, so uh, we're, we'll move over to slide 18 now. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that uh, Aaron and I have been working as a team for quite a while now. Um, and this team is really comprised of 
Aaron, who's an ecotoxicologist, and myself as an animal behavior researcher or a behavioral ecologist. And so in a lot of the studies where that we've done together, where we look at the effects of pharmaceuticals on wildlife, we choose to focus on behavior as an endpoint. And this is for a number of different reasons. Um, firstly, because pharmaceuticals, as Aaron just mentioned, are designed to affect uh, physiology and behavior in humans. And so it's likely that they can also have effects um, in animals as well. But we also study behavior because it's an extremely important uh, trait for survival and reproductive prospects in animals. And so this is essentially their evolutionary fitness that we're talking about. I mean, if you don't behave very competently in the wild, then you won't be very successful at, at surviving or reproducing. Uh, and behavior is also very important if we want to understand processes that affect higher levels of biological organization. Um, and so what do I mean by this? Well, if you look on slide 18, um, we have a diagram here that shows how life on earth can really be represented as a structured hierarchy um, of physical, chemical, and biological processes that are all building upon one another. And so you can see this on the slide, the hierarchy of biological levels that start out with very uh, the very small microscopic levels going up to the whole organism level and then up to populations, communities, and ecosystems. And so at the very low levels, we can study things like how molecular interactions affect the functioning of cells and tissues. We can go a bit higher and study how tissues and organs interact with one another via maybe the, the endocrine or the nervous system to influence the health and well-being of the whole organism. And then at even higher levels, now we can start to study things like, oh, how multiple organisms live and interact together to form populations or how individuals and populations interact to form communities and so forth. <clears throat> but importantly, it's through behavior that organisms interact with one another and their environments. So if we want to understand, say, population dynamics, or if we want to maybe sustainably manage our environment and the ecosystems within it, well, this requires a deep understanding of the behavior of the animals living in these systems. So what happens when a habitat becomes polluted with pharmaceuticals? Uh, for example, if they're dumped into the environment by a wastewater treatment plant. Will this change the way that the animals behave in these environments? Uh, and does this have any consequences for the populations and communities of organisms that are living there? So let's go to the next slide and imagine, for example, that pharmaceuticals can change the natural behavior of animals. It can either change the behavior themselves, or maybe it'll make it so that the animals can no longer express the behaviors uh, in the correct contexts in the wild. Well, if this is the case, then exposed animals may no longer be able to find mates or social partners. They may no longer be able to care for their offspring as well as they should. Perhaps they're not able to live together in groups as cohesively as otherwise, or maybe they simply, if they're exposed to pharmaceuticals, they no longer pay attention to their surroundings or to the dangers in their environments. And what this all means is that individuals exposed to pharmaceutical pollution, well, maybe they're not able to respond to the challenges of their daily lives anymore. For some, that might mean the difference between life and death. And for others, well, maybe it's a the difference between being able to reproduce versus not re being able to reproduce. And yet for others, perhaps it's the difference between simply raising one baby or raising five babies. So the degree of severity might differ from one case to another, but in theory, changing the behavior of individual organisms can have a number of impacts at various scales of biological organization. So we are particularly, or were particularly interested for this study in one type of behavior, which was predator-prey interactions. And we can see a couple picture examples of, of this on slide 20. <clears throat> so these are uh, the interactions that occur when one individual attempts to capture and eat another one. Essentially, one individual is running for a meal and the other one is running for their life. 
Uh, and these are incredibly common interactions in nature. You know, nature is a, is a pretty grim place. Animals eat each other all the time. And predator-prey interactions are extremely important for a stable ecosystem. So we started wondering, um, now we're on slide 21. Uh, so we started wondering whether pharmaceutical pollutants could affect the ways that predators hunted their prey, or maybe the way that prey tried to escape from their predators. So imagine what might happen if an environment is exposed to pharmaceuticals and this pollution caused predators to maybe be more efficient hunters or maybe less efficient hunters, or, or maybe it makes prey better able to escape or worse um, at escaping um, their hunters, their predators. Any of these changes could conceivably affect species abundances. It could restructure entire communities. So we wanted to set out to run an experiment to really look into whether pharmaceutical pollution could affect predator-prey interactions. On slide 22, we'll see what the study system was that we decided to work with. Um, <clears throat> we needed a species of predator and a species of prey for our experiments. And we chose the damselfly and dragonfly system. So this, at first, this might seem like a relatively odd choice. Um, because for most people, when you think about dragonflies or damselflies, you're not really thinking about top predators, right? Um, and um, when most people think about dragonflies and damselflies, they're probably thinking about the adult forms uh, that you see on the slide. But what we chose to work with are their larval forms, which look very different, as you'll see on slide 23. So here we see some pictures of a dragonfly nymph, also a, a dragonfly larva on the left and a damselfly larva on the right. So while the adult forms fly through the air, the larval forms are aquatic and they live in freshwater lakes, streams, ponds, etc. Um, and in this case, really the lives of the adults, they give off a vibe of being very peaceful and it really belies the nature of the lives of the, of the larvae. Life as a larval dragonfly or especially damselfly is hell. I would say it's incredibly dangerous and a lot of things want to eat you. Um, and in this case, uh, in the case of these two species, it's the dragonfly larva that's the voracious predator of the damselfly larva. So dragons really love to eat, to eat damsels. Uh, but the damselflies have a very cool defense mechanism up their sleeve that they can use uh, against predators like the dragonflies. So on slide 24, uh, I have to apologize a bit for the low resolution of the diagram. It was taken from Encyclopedia Britannica, um, but it has a good illustration of how dragonfly larvae hunt. So they, they hunt their prey by <clears throat> projecting their lower jaws out really quickly towards their prey to try and grab hold of them. So they're really ambush predators or sit and wait predators, and they lunge out very quickly to try and grasp their prey. On slide 25, we see that damselflies have this interesting defense mechanism. Uh, and this is that they have three appendages at the end of their abdomens. And they look like leaves or paddles at first. And they, these are called um, caudal lamellae. So these little appendages, they help the larvae swim through the water. And they can also be used as gills to help them breathe. So overall, they're extremely useful. Um, useful little traits. So when a dragonfly larva grabs hold of a damselfly by its lamellae, the lamellae can actually break off. So this allows the damselfly a chance to escape, which leaves the predator behind simply holding on to the lamella. So this process of breaking off is in what we call in biological terms, autotomy. So this means the self amputation of an appendage, and it's usually in the context of trying to save oneself from a predator. So autotomy is something that's evolved actually a whole bunch of different times in many different organisms. And a rather well-known example is in, in some lizards, like some geckos and skinks, they're able to shed their tails when they're attacked by a predator. So this is a, you can imagine this is a pretty extreme thing to do, right? To sacrifice a piece of your body, but in return, you get to live a little while longer. For our experiment, we found this to be extremely useful. And this is because autotomy leaves behind essentially 
accountable record of failed predation attempts. So this means that we can put a predator and a prey together and we can check on them periodically. Each time uh, a, a damselfly goes missing, this means that the dragonfly successfully captured their prey. But each time a lamella goes missing on the abdomen of a damselfly, this means that the dragonfly was unsuccessful in capturing their prey. So this gives us a way to quantify both successful and successful um, predation attempts. So on slide 26, um, we can see a, a graphical abstract of the paper. And what we did was we captured some wild damselfly and dragonfly larvae local to where we are in northern Sweden. We brought them to the lab for some behavioral trials, and we exposed them to two different pharmaceuticals, cetirizine and citalopram, as well as their mixture. So cetirizine is an allergy medication. It's an antihistamine. Um, and citalopram is an antidepressant. It's an SSRI. It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And these are both very common drugs taken by many people around the world. They're commonly prescribed, and, and, and therefore they're also commonly found in surface waters, especially near wastewater treatment plants. So we took the in insects from a pristine, a clean environment in the wild, and we exposed them to these pharmaceuticals in the lab. And we exposed them at concentrations that would reflect what we could expect to measure in some wastewater polluted environments. Um, so on slides uh, 27, 28, and 29, you can see a few pictures showing um, the, the, the procedure that we went through. And we were, I would say, very fortunate to have such a beautiful location to work at, to collect our animals from. These pictures are of a lake near to Umeå, which is the city in Sweden where we are based. And on the right, you can see one of our team members and chest waiters collecting bugs using a dip net. Uh, and so the dip nets bring back lots of different creatures that we then have to sort through on the shore. Um, and we were sorting through everything for the two species that we're, that we're interested in, uh, which in our case was the Northern damselfly and the common hawker dragonfly. So we transport animals back to our lab at the university and we'll keep them in special climate controlled rooms. Um, so these are rooms where the temperature can be held at very specific levels, and we can also control the light cycle so we can simulate um, sunrise and sunset. And this essentially lets us keep the animals in a temperature and a light environment that matches where they came from in the wild. And what you see here is also a variety of different aquariums, lighting stands for, for camera recording, and different sized tanks for running our trials in. So on to slide 30, um, our, our project involved placing the animals into two scenarios. So in scenario one, we put a single predator, a single dragonfly in with a single prey into an arena together and tracked the movements of the, the dragonfly predator. So we wanted to know if the predator would be successful in capturing their prey or if the prey was successful in evading the predator. And we actually used an object detection tracking program to do this. Um, slide 31 shows the first of our results. And I have to say right away, we found some very striking effects of the pharmaceutical treatment. So when they were exposed to the drugs, the predators all moved significantly more within their arenas. So on the x-axis here, you see the different exposure treatments that the, the, the bugs were exposed to. Um, and on the y-axis, you see a measure of how much they moved around in their arenas during the trials. So whereas control bugs were more sedentary, the exposed bugs were re really active. And so activity rate is a very general measure to take, and it's one that's pretty commonly measured in a lot of behavioral ecotoxicology studies. And what it tells us is, is that something interesting is going on. So there's a lot of commotion going on in these in these arenas. And to find out what this is, we have to dig a little deeper. Um, and so on the next slide, we see uh, another result that shows how cetirizine seems to make it less likely that a predator would actually capture its prey. And so here you're seeing survival curves um, for the prey organisms over time. 
at the beginning of the trials, we have, of course, 100% of the prey alive, but at the end of the trials, some groups had only 50% of the prey alive, while others had around 70. And so in the cetirazine exposure group, the prey had a much higher chance um, of survival than in the control group. And also in the, in the mixture group too, you'll, you'll notice that when we, that the mixture exposure also had relatively or elevated survival rates compared to the controls. So in our first experiment, we're seeing an effect where pharmaceuticals are increasing the general activity um, of, the, of the predators and the prey. And for cetirazine, we're seeing that predators seem to be worse at capturing their prey. Uh, but we're, as we're about to see, the story does get a little more complicated. So on to slide 33, we see the setup for the second scenario in our, in our project. So here we placed a single predator into an arena, but then placed eight prey items with them. And in these trials, we checked the insects periodically over a 24-hour uh, period. So here we could count how many prey had been eaten, and importantly, also how many lamellae had been autotomized. So remember, it's, this is a record of successful and unsuccessful predation attempts. So slide 34, we're seeing some results from this scenario, and this time our results look very different. So it looks here that cetirazine actually made it more likely that the damselflies would be eaten relative to our controls. And on the x-axis here, you see treatment group again. On the y-axis, you'll see the, the proportion out of eight prey that were eaten over 24 hours. So in this case, both the cetirazine and mixture groups had higher mortality rates compared to controls. So it's really the opposite of what we found in the first experiment. Um, and, a, and a very interesting result is now on slide 35, um, where we found that lamellar autotomy occurred more often in the citalopram group. So what this means is that the damselflies in this group were able to evade the predators more often using their ability to self-amputate this appendage. Slide 36 now, well, what does all this mean? Well, it means that pharmaceuticals, at least the ones that we investigated here, can affect the way that predators and prey interact with one another, but perhaps not in a very clear and easy to, way un, uh, easy to understand way. Um, and this is perhaps a very common occurrence in science. Things always tend to be more complicated than you first expect. Um, the drugs we tested, particularly cetirazine, had this effect where they either made it harder to catch a prey or easier to catch a prey, depending on the experiment and the, the social context. Uh, and we, we, we did find that in one experimental treatment, the predators seemingly became sloppier or less efficient, as indicated by the increased rates of lamellar autotomy. And so what this suggests is that in polluted is that polluted habitats can experience altered predator-prey relationships, and this makes it harder to predict how species communi communities will be structured in impacted areas. So I, we think that this is a very exciting area of research, and we're, we're hoping to expand on it uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, we will leave it at that, I think, for the for the slides, and I think we're happy to take some questions now. Yeah, and you'll be able to see there's a few more slides here, but there are kind of some extra ones we have uh, that we might use for certain questions that might get asked. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, and I think for this really important work um, that you're doing, and that you're taking the time to share this with us in such a really um, interesting way. So. Um, First of all, thank you for that. And um, yeah, everyone that has a question, please go ahead and and raise your hand or uh, post comments in the chat um, if you um, yeah if you cannot you know speak um, up uh, for now. And um, 
and in the meantime, I saw that Tim uh, Tom had the question um, mm -hmm. in there, but I feel like you kind of answered that. I don't know. Do you see the chat uh, in terms of cause and effects? Yeah, it's an interesting question. That's yeah. about whether the the actual pharmaceutical is what's driving the behavioral effects, or maybe a, a breakdown product of the the pharmaceutical within the the organism. Yeah, and um, I can answer that. Well, I, I can try to answer that. <laughs> um, a lot of pharmaceuticals actually have bioactive metabolites, like. Tom has pointed out here. So sometimes pharmaceuticals break down and it's the thing that they break down into that is actually more biologically active than the parent compound or the, the original compound. Um, I can't say without doing a bit more research um, uh, for certain about cetirizine and citalopram, uh, what their ratios are. I, I know for some a few others that we work with commonly, uh, we don't at least at this moment, know of any uh, bioactive metabolites, and we didn't measure any in our study. But in some of our other work, we've looked at uh, the metabolites of, for example, fluoxetine, which is another SSRI antidepressant, or some of the benzodiazepines that break down into other active compounds. So it was not the purpose of this study to answer that question. This was mainly focusing on the, the parent compounds and whether they cause beha behavioral change. But the question about their their breakdown products is really at the forefront of the field. And other researchers in our lab are actually working on that question. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested, I could I could definitely share some links about that. <clears throat> Yeah, Tom, I, I see you here. Did that answer your question or did you want to follow up? Oh, um, yes, it did. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, it's been a really uh, interesting and wonderful presentation and really makes me wonder also is that uh, um, if we have, um, <clears throat> say, a pharmaceutical effect on the behavior of uh, a prey, uh, how might that affect the predator and the predator's predator and et cetera, et cetera. So that really goes up the food chain. And um, it um, amazes me, but also scares me to wonder how um, different pharmaceuticals could affect different changes, um, especially on potentially important um, um, animal groups like uh, insect groups like um, the bees uh, that we rely on for pollination um, and also uh, the food that we eat. So um, how might you envision that some of these um, potentially recalcitrant pharmaceuticals might actually significantly affect, say, food crop production or even um, how the microbes in the environment might um, be involved uh, superficially in global change, uh, etc. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for the question. There's that's a, that's a very deep question. It's a deep and and there's questions within questions there. Um, what I can say a little bit is that you you touched on microbes, for example. So wastewater effluents uh, discharging antibiotics into freshwater environments is a big concern for the development and evolution of antimicrobial and antibiotic resistance. It is not an area that I currently work in, but there are other world-class researchers that are focusing on this question specifically. Um, yeah, and if you were really interested, you could email me and I could, I could get you some <clears throat> contact information or websites of people who work in that area. That could answer your questions. Um, as for the bees, that's an interesting question, and I, I don't know of any studies off the top of my head that have looked at how pharmaceuticals, for example, in water, uh, might affect bee behavior. Uh, a more pr pressing, or not pressing, but a more commonly studied question is how different pesticides affect bee behavior. 
there's a lot of work done showing that different neonicotinoid pesticides are um, bad for bees, that they impact their learning or their ability to remember where they forage for uh, food during pollination. It would be really interesting to study how different pharmaceuticals might affect uh, bee behavior. Uh, we'd have to design some lab studies to do that or some do some field sampling. But one thing I, I can just say is that the idea of that you kind of touched on here, the transfer of pharmaceuticals from aquatic environments to terrestrial environments is really at the forefront of this research field right now. Um, me and some researchers have recently done a study here in Sweden where we looked at the transfer of pharmaceuticals from water to riparian spiders. So spiders that live and forage along uh, aquatic water bodies. And we did find certain pharmaceuticals tend to bioconcentrate in uh, spiders more than others. There were different um, antibiotics as well as uh, anti or psych psychiatric medications. Um, as how it would affect crop production or food production, uh, I can't say with much certainty right now. But another thing to think about is that uh, when wastewater uh, Treat, treatment plants create biosolids, so the solid waste that comes from wastewater treatment plant, some of that gets spread back onto farmland. So I know that there is research now, now being done, for example, on if you put biosolids on a field that's growing tomatoes or lettuce, how much uh, pharmaceuticals that are in those biosolids end up in, in lettuce and, and uh, different vegetable products. So that's something that's being actively researched right now. Um, but I don't have any uh, con concrete uh, kind of take home snippets of results. It's all very complex and still being researched. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the an important <laughs> thing to note is that everything in the wild is is really being exposed in to mixtures, and so it's we we do our experiments on one or two compounds, and we try and and figure out what effects that might have. Um, and whether that translates to effects in the wild is is a bit of a different story, which is why we are striving towards doing more work on on mixtures or using wastewater effluent itself, which is a which is a mixture um, to expose our, our our test animals to figure out what effects that they'll have. But it's it gets quite almost overwhelming once you start thinking a bit much about the the complexity of the uh, mixtures that animals are getting exposed to in the wild, and then also the rippling effects, like you said, that um, are going on across trophic levels. Um, not only rippling effects, but these these reciprocal effects through social interactions, where one individual whose behavior is perturbed will affect an, the behavior of another individual, and and vice versa. And this can change selection pressures that animals face and can change the evolutionary trajectories of the populations. But um, yeah, the, the, the questions are seemingly endless. Maybe we can. Yeah, I saw there was another question here from Deepak on what are the initiatives taken by pharmaceuticals uh, to minimize the effects on aquatic ecosystems? And that's a really interesting question uh, because we by no means are advocating that people should stop using their pharmaceutical medications, especially if you need them for various illnesses. Definitely don't uh, stop using them. They are miracles of modern medicine. Um, but there's kind of two approaches to removing pharmaceuticals uh, from or preventing pharmaceuticals from entering the environment. And one could be called an end of pipe solution. So that's something like upgrading wastewater treatment plant technologies. So there's more modern uh, types of, of wastewater treatment that are better at removing pharmaceuticals before they're put back into the environment. However, those cost a lot of money. Uh, and so then there are big um, infrastructure investment that uh, municipalities uh, have to make, and that ends up costing taxpayers a lot of money. So it, it's very contentious, a very contentious topic in a socio-political perspective. Then there's kind of the before pipe solutions, which might mean engineering or designing pharmaceuticals to break down more quickly uh, so that they have less of a lasting effect. Uh, that's one idea. 
or also changing prescription patterns. And now I said that you shouldn't stop using the pharmaceuticals that you need to use, of course. But a good example of this is uh, how there's been a recent shift in not over prescribing certain pharmaceuticals like antibiotics so that we don't um, contribute to the rise of antimicrobial resistance. So those are the kind of two perspectives on how we can deal with pharmaceutical pollution. Do we either stop it at the end of the pipe before, just before it enters the environment or we make changes in our consumption and design of pharmaceuticals so that they have less of an effect and don't need to be removed before they hit the environment. Yeah. And and I can say that uh, a little plug for the institution where we're at, the Swedish University for Agricultural Sciences (SLU), there are researchers um, here at the at the university who are working with wastewater treatment plant technologies and trying to design new technologies specifically for removing different classes of pharmaceuticals and personal care products. So it's on people's minds. We're we're getting engineers to to try and tackle this program, sorry, this problem. Is there another one? I have a question, uh, if you have some time. Yeah. So, um, back when I was in high school, I used to, uh, try and get out the city. I'm from Chicago during the summertime. And one, uh, the things I used to do was go to these, uh, little research programs at, uh, University of Illinois. And they have a pretty big agricultural, um, school up there. And this particular summer, the, project that I was uh, kind of tasked with or got to help out with um, had to do with um, the differences in the actual fauna in these different um, microenvironments and different streams that may be up or downstream from um, agricultural um, places where there would be runoff. One of the things we saw was there was um, differences in the actual invertebrates that was there. So I was kind of curious to if you guys did or even could um, kind of see if there is a difference, excuse me, if there's a difference between the actual fauna between places that are, you know, um, uh, uh, pharmaceutical runoff or, or waste versus agricultural <clears throat> runoff and waste and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh yeah, I mean you're you're describing one of our research projects right now. Uh, <laughs> this is a this is a big program that we have going on, or it's it's spearheaded by by Erin. It's really her her uh, one of her academic babies. Uh, so I'll let, I'll let her describe it. Yeah. So uh, right now I'm sampling um, fish uh, fish communities and aquatic invertebrate communities at wastewater treatment plant outfalls upstream and downstream to look at how these inputs of like complex chemical stressors affect biodiversity in these environments. I don't have any um, answers for you about this study right now because I'm still collecting the data, but in theory, wastewater treatment plants have, tend to discharge uh, nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that can enrich the environment around an outfall. So that might mean that they're able to attract organisms to these sites. So you might have more aquatic invertebrates or more fish actually at an outfall where they might be potentially exposed to harmful pollution and they, they can't tell that. But it all depends again on, the, on how toxic or how um, dirty the effluent is, if you will, um, because there'll be some threshold where it won't be conducive to supporting aquatic life. The nutrients will be too high, it'll be de devoid of oxygen, so then animals won't live there. So it really will depend a bit on the treatment uh, level of the wastewater treatment plant, um, and then, yeah, the animals that tend to live in those environments to begin with. So it's a definitely a great question and it's something that uh, people are thinking about and your the program that you did sounds really interesting uh, mm -hmm. it would be cool to learn a bit more about uh, the researcher or the research group you were working with there yeah the so that the, what we're describing here the the attractive force or the potential for some of these point sources of nutrients and pollution to actually attract animals and, and change the community around them 
is what's called an ecological trap, or at least that's the um, how we we're, we're thinking about things. So it's a, a kind of abiotic conditions that really are attractive to uh, to animals, but then when they've been attracted to a certain area, they're then exposed to some deleterious factors as well. And so we are envisioning or we're hypothesizing that things like wastewater treatment plants can act as these traps in the wild. And <clears throat> but uh, what we're looking for in this research program is change in differences in species community, fish communities, insect communities downstream and at the outfalls of these wastewater plants. And unfortunately, we don't have any straight answers for you yet because the data has not been analyzed yet. But it is currently being gathered, and it's a project that it's an ongoing, long-term project. So we're ho we're hoping to really dig into the data in the coming year or or so. I have a follow-up question, and also uh, before I get to the follow-up question, I'll uh, see if I can reach out to that project head because uh, essentially it's a it's a um, the whole purpose of that program is to get like at-risk uh, youth from inner cities. Um, Pretty much across the globe so you know i came from chicago we had people from puerto rico and some people even from greece that would come over to take part in the program uh, i'll see if i can contact them to see if they can find out which lab is responsible this is shit, mm -hmm. man 15 16 <laughs> years ago so it may not even be the same person in that department but uh i can see if i can contact them and i'll follow no, you no, so far. no worries no worries okay if you can't it sounds like but, uh, a Super interesting program, and I'm really glad you were able to partake in something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, even so, like uh, collaboration in the scientific field to me is always a beauty. Uh, but my follow-up question, um, is kind of sounds like that sometimes when you get these uh newly polluted environments, that it can cause a change in the uh microenvironment of whatever space like in this regards uh different water systems that could almost cause like an ecological hole and like now my question is like do you think it's worth investigating if if there is ecological hole if that's what makes like certain invasive species so easy to invade because um the reason why i asked that being from chicago uh we have like uh like these little water systems that go through the downtown area and the water is dirty as all hell and one mm -hmm. of the issues we have is invasive species and it kind of makes me wonder if the lack of diversity uh ended up making the the hole for these invasive species to then come in and thrive yeah i think you hit the nail on the head there um the effects that these environmental stressors can have so these chemical stressors can be to reduce the biodiversity of a native ecosystem and one of the possible consequences of a reduced biodiversity in an ecosystem is that the that its biotic resistance goes down and that's essentially uh what we call how how resistant an an ecosystem is to being invaded by a non-native. So it's it's certainly possible that by damaging or reducing the diversity of a native ecosystem, you make it more susceptible for invaders to come in and take root and and to proliferate. So it's certainly very 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 plausible. Yeah, and, and we've even, in my PhD research, we even saw that happen. So I did my PhD research in Hamilton, Canada, which is on the edge of Lake Ontario, um, and a very, like, kind of like Chicago, super polluted city, it has historical steel industry, you know, three different wastewater treatment plants discharging into one harbor, and so on. But we found that when fish communities near our wastewater treatment plants were really uh, driven by one invasive species that was super common. So it seemed like kind of an empty habitat that this invasive species decided, yeah, this looks great. And because they tended to have 
you know, traits themselves that allowed them to live in a less desirable area, they were able to exploit the empty habitat. So, yeah, like they yeah. they tend to be extremely tolerant to a wide range of conditions, and uh, yeah. many native species are less tolerant, and so they these invaders tend to outcompete them in these already stressful uh, environments. Chicago is a super interesting area too, because you've got kind of the connection point between the Great Lakes water system and the Mississippi watershed, and there's a lot of efforts being put in. Uh, Chicago to prevent the spread of invasive species both from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi and vice versa. So it's really an, an interesting area to do research like that. Absolutely. Thank you for asking more questions. No problem. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much for all these questions. And I wanted to check with you um, how much time you still have because we've been going over an hour. So I wanted to, you know, oh, we're, happy. Of your... <laughs> we're happy to we answer some more questions if, you, if there's still more, uh, whatever you guys as moderators prefer. Um, so is it, uh, Deepak asked in the chat, is it possible that excise dumping of pharmaceutical waste to aquatic ec um, ecosystem leads to mutation or extinction of certain species in the year, next years to come, or is it already happening? Extinction, um, yeah, that's an extremely, that's a, a very extreme outcome, and we can point to certain extreme <clears throat> examples where something like this has happened, um, like the vulture example. Yeah, it's, it's but not, it's, it will it, never be an extinction, like uh, a whole species extinction, where they'd be removed from the face of the earth and you'd never see them again. It'll be more, we're talking local. Local extinction. extinctions, where you might, their species used to be there, but then because they started adding um, contaminants, it, they're not able to live there anymore. Um, so, yeah, a good, yeah, as Anish mentioned, the vulture example. So in, um, in uh, I guess this, this study was mainly done in India, but basically the um, cattle were being treated with an anti-inflammatory drug called diclofenac. And then when cattle ended up dying, the carcasses were left out in vultures, which are a predatory kind of scavenger bird. Uh, they would come and feed on the carcasses, but vultures ended up being very sensitive to diclofenac, and they um, died uh, after being exposed by foraging on these contaminated carcasses that were contaminated by being treated with pharmaceuticals. So that led to local extinctions of these, uh, I can't remember which species of vulture, but a vulture uh, in, the, in the area that this uh, treatment was happening. Mm -hmm. So it's something that can happen transiently in a specific kind of area, but we haven't seen at a, you know, continental or global scale by any means. And there's still the possibility that when you have a local extinction that you can have a reintroduction if you remove the stressor and either the species naturally moves back into its uh, normal range or it's reintroduced by a restoration program or a reintroduction program. Yeah, thank you. That is interesting. And I wanted to also add the question, maybe um, the relationship to like the human environment. Do you feel like this is kind of a model, a bigger, more complex model system than researching this in the in the animals in the lab? And this could reflect maybe some mental health related problems or behavior, especially in uh, uh, evolving human, like a child, um, like that symptoms maybe occur more often or are more prevalent, um, prevalent because of this exposure um, in the environment? Or don't you think that this would be the case? Do you mean, um, do you mean that like, um that exposure to pollutants in the environment, the human exposure to pollutants from the environment is driving like changes in human behavior. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, in drinking water and so on, I would assume that there are also 
pharmaceuticals that's, and so on. <laughs> that's definitely uh, an interesting question. And I think it's hard to answer. It's hard for me to say. Um, a good, a, a better field of research to answer that question is it, environmental epidemiology. So that's more people who do research on the effects of chemical contaminants on human disease burden and occurrence on a like large scale. Um, I know that there's been correlates, for example, uh, that have been done when leaded gasoline and leaded paint used to be used and IQ scores in children, for example. And then once uh, lead was removed from gasoline and paint that we saw IQ scores go up. Um, but there, that's all correlation. It's hard to prove causation with relationships like that. Um, and unfortunately, well, not maybe not unfortunately, fortunately, uh, with humans, you can't uh, put them in a lab and expose them to different compounds. You kind of have to rely on these uh, correlational relationships. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but it's definitely a possibility, but it's not something that I know of uh, that's been studied mm -hmm. so far. Oh, yeah, yeah, I... I... Yeah, I, I would assume that is very complicated and really hard to do always <laughs> everything in human, like what's yeah. the causation. But um, yeah, it's interesting to think of kind of the whole system there. And because we see so many, like such a rise in, you know, in, in mental health disorders, especially in youth and preteens and so on. And we mm -hmm. make all kinds of links, but it's probably a huge mixture of stuff, but I feel like people care more um, to regulate these exposures if it's also affecting humans. I guess that's why I made the yes. question. <laughs> like, Absolutely. A hundred percent. It's not until, yeah. People care more about humans and the environment, for sure. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, like, I don't know, is there, a huge variability of amounts of pharmaceuticals depending on where people live in which countries like I would yeah. assume that in places where they prescribe just more would probably be higher exposure variation yeah yeah so there's um there's a lot of global variation and in uh, that study that I we showed with the map and all the little dots on it that study uh, also measured the concentrations of various pharmaceuticals um, in different countries around the world. And basically the highest concentrations are in countries that have developed enough infrastructure to deliver pharmaceuticals to the population masses, but they don't have um, well-developed wastewater treatment. Uh, so this tends to be more um, middle income countries that are rapidly growing at the moment. It, you also, there's just a ton of variation in what pharmaceuticals end up in the environment based on the population that feeds the wastewater treatment plant. Is there a hospital connected to it? Is the population an aging population? Uh, there's also even variations on a weekly or a diurnal or a daily basis. You tend to see more pharmaceuticals uh, you know, in the mornings and the evenings uh, when people are at home, um, and you see certain variation, seasonal variation, for example, in um, pharmaceuticals being discharged, uh, like uh, anti, what are they called? Antihistamines, <laughs> antihistamines that treat uh, seasonal allergies. You tend to find those more in the spring and summer than you do in the winter. And even the seasons themselves can affect how pharmaceuticals in the wild will break down. So. Mm -hmm. The amount of UV they're going to get will affect how they degrade in the environment, how warm it is. As, as with everything in ecology, it's complicated and it depends. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a ton of variation, like you say. And on this, this note, there's also interest in using these technologies to, to quantify pharmaceuticals, but also illicit drugs um, in the wastewater of various towns and communities um basically to get a an overview of the 
drug consumption um, going on in, in in different areas, and so that's uh, that's something, something that happens. happens. <laughs> yeah, the wastewater monitoring. Yeah, I would say that around Brooklyn, all fish are on probably shrooms and coke right now. <laughs> <laughs> Quite what the fish do there but um yeah no it's i think it's a very important research and i read an article it was a few years ago that basically says exactly to those drugs if you don't need a drug just don't take it because it's bad for your ecosystem around you so yeah that's yeah, a, i would emphasize that try or strive for mm. Definitely. So, yeah, I think this is a very important research field. And is there also a lot of development and developing better and cheaper sensors for a better and larger scale, um, you know, monitoring? Or is that something that people are not really yet thinking about or governments or, you know, different districts because it's, people are not aware yet of that problem so much. No, I, monitoring programs are definitely something that uh, people want as well as different governments would like and costs always are basically the bottom line. There is research, I'm, I'm sure that there's research going on about how can we monitor chemicals in a more cost-effective manner because right now, we tend to use things like mass spectrometry to measure pharmaceuticals or the concentration of different pollutants in samples that we get, whether it be in water or tissues. Uh, but running a mass spectrometer costs quite a lot of money. They cost a ton of money just to buy to begin with, and they tend to be located in you know, commercial labs or universities or government research institutions. So it's something that I'm sure is being developed, but at the moment there isn't any really easy solutions to it yet and hopefully in, over the next you know 20 50 years we'll we'll see that gap getting closed yeah it's still a very a rather expensive endeavor yeah i um i imagine that it it can be easy and um but the, yeah i feel like the cheaper it gets and also developing countries and where the problems may be kind of very acute now um, would be able to monitor better and help with that, um, you know, keeping this problem at bay, basically, um, you, you would just be more affordable. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, but I, I don't know enough of the field of um, developing those type of sensors. I know that there's a lot of development in personal sensors, you know, on phones and stuff to maybe a red ball to maybe monitor black sugar levels and, and, and alcohol levels and things like that. But I'm not sure if you can, could just use that um, to develop also sensors that you could just stick in the, your water at home. <laughs> I yeah, don't know. Yeah. It's a, be yeah, it'd be super tremendous. interesting and definitely something that would increase the access of lots of communities to be able to monitor pollution in their environment so yeah i would put a lot of different of these chemical pollutant problems more on the radar yeah so, so it's a problem that hopefully our engineers and chemists and so on will will tackle in the future <clears throat> yeah i agree even if the absolute value is not of course not as accurate but as long as it can tell differences pretty yeah. well mm -hmm. That would be really good. And are there filters or anything that actually kind of break down pharmaceuticals really well? Or just, you know, sunlight exposure is enough? Like, are any districts working on um, somehow destructing or filtering pharmaceuticals out already? Uh, yeah. So some of the uh, extra treatment stages that I showed in my, in my graph, uh, UV sterilization is one way to remove pharmaceuticals, uh, as well as ozone sterilization. 
charcoal filtration and sand filtration are other ways to remove them then don't function maybe quite as well as ozone or, or UV. They're not just quite as effective. Um, there's also something called membrane uh, reactors, uh, which I, I can't describe how those work because I don't know enough about them myself, but they're essentially a membrane technology that um, would absorb pharmaceuticals as water passes through them. Um, so these are all definitely have been researched and designed for use on wastewater treatment plants and are now being put out in wastewater treat at wastewater treatment plants. A great example of this is actually in Switzerland where um, the poll population voted to have advanced treatment on wastewater treatment plants to remove emerging contaminants like pharmaceuticals. So at a national scale, they invested in the infrastructure to remove pharmaceuticals um, with these advanced treatment technologies. In Sweden, for example, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, these types of technologies are being implemented but it's a slow process. Usually uh, an area has to first do a study to show that there is pharmaceutical pollution, and then they have to get the, um, you know, the money together basically to be able to afford to do this kind of upgrade and implementation, which can just take time. And then once the money is recruited, it's another question of building the infrastructure at scale. So I think it's, it's something that we'll see more and more, especially in, uh, developed countries um, moving forward that already have base level wastewater treatment plants functioning and then they'll add on these, these advanced upgrades. upgrades yeah of course Switzerland does it I mean they, you always feel like um, they do everything better than anyone else <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, I really hope that, um, you know, a communities, governments will listen and then implement those. And I hope, you know, that you continue getting a lot of funding and, and to do this research and maybe even, you know, do more, because I think it's, it's a really important part of pollution that gets ignored a lot and um is there a reason why you went to sweden like doesn't this get funded too much oh, here yeah. on this part where i like in, in the yeah. states or in canada a lot like is there a higher sensitivity in europe for this no 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 um it all had to do with um and, and with finding a postdoc so at the time when I finished my PhD, I had applied to do postdocs in several different labs that were working on this area, uh, some in Canada, some in the US, and, and some in, in Europe. And it just, you know, the way things broke down, that the proposal that we wrote, uh, me and my pro po postdoc supervisor, Thomas Burden, um, was funded in Sweden. And then I, I moved to Sweden to, to do that project. and have been very fortunate to continue developing my career here since then. Um, so it's a global problem and there's researchers that do work on questions like this in, in the US and Canada as well. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, the, the reason why I moved was, you know, the opportunity to work with somebody and have the project supported at the time. Yeah, I'm glad yeah. to hear that there's still, even after Trump, that there's still <laughs> researchers here and yeah. they're working on this so there, there's <laughs> there are these hubs for different for researching different topics and they don't necessarily have to be located in an area where that topic is a is, is a is a super high priority or problem but uh, it sort of is an expert in the field who's building a a working group around them and and invites lots of researchers there and you just passively increase the the working group and you get you get these these areas of expertise who happen to be in areas in our case in northern sweden which is far removed from a lot of population and a lot of wastewater but still is very active in researching it yeah that's really interesting and i mean if you would want or if somebody, um, you know, 
would want to transition to study this in humans, I think the public data sets are quite good in 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 Sweden and Norway also to look into um, you know region specific maybe outcomes in health. I think you know a lot of public health research is based on a data set from these countries so that would be another upside maybe for the future or is that correct uh possibly yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's also i think there's lots of like long-term um blood for example like blood monitoring data sets that are hosted in the u.s as well through the and uh, not nih that's uh that's um is that you is that or is that the uk uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe the NIH um, that yeah have taken blood samples, for example, over decades and can measure the different pollutants in them in, in humans. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, a possibility. It's and perhaps there's more access here in Europe. Well, yeah. What I think, as I said, this is you know really important, and and I congratulate you on this research. And um, thank you so much for coming and sharing this with us. And I'll be really curious to continue following uh, your work because, um, yeah, it's it's such a it's a field that is really complicated. And I always <laughs> admire people that go into ecosystem behavior fields because. Yeah, it's a high complex system, so so it's it's really important. So thank you and thanks for doing oh, this research. Very welcome too. But thank yeah, thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been so fun sharing our work with you today. Yeah, and um also everyone, thanks for posting comments, asking questions. Um <laughs> and if people um like research talks like this like or similar um we'll have our next um room about biomaterial and nanoparticles that were developed as a new method for a spinal cord repair so if you would be interested come back and um yeah thank you again anish and aaron uh, good luck for the future and um, yeah, I hope maybe we'll hear you one day again. So thank you again. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. Everyone. Okay, I'll close the room in three, two, one. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.